Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. Tax Reform 2.0 to the latest in tax controversies. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services Leader. You can watch these podcasts on YouTube at youtube.com slash Doug McConey. This week, we're back in Westminster Studios in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm excited to be joined by PwC International Tax Partner and Value Chain Transformation Specialist Tom Quinn. Tom has spent his entire career focused on the tax implications of cross-border business models, has dedicated considerable amount of time studying our subpart F rules and regulations, and as I mentioned in our prior podcast covering the original Whirlpool Tax Court case, is one of a number of my mentors that I'm honored to finally have in person on the podcast. Tom, welcome back to Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Doug. Nice to be back. So it was May of 2020, Tom. I mean, a long time ago, but it doesn't really feel like that as the pandemic lockdown was in full effect that the tax court made decision related to the subpart F branch rules in what's commonly referred to as the Whirlpool case. And in that podcast, I remind you, we did virtually, and I'm so happy to have you in person. Yeah, indeed. I'd highly encourage our listeners to check out Tom and my podcast for May 2020 for some of the background and a little bit more detail on the tax court case. All right, so let's dive into a little bit more substantive material here. So it was on December 6, 2021, that the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit in Whirlpool versus Commissioner affirmed the U.S. Tax Court's May 5th, 2020 decision. The tax court held that Whirlpool's controlled foreign corporation in Luxembourg had earned subpart F foreign-based company sales income from supplying appliances manufactured in Mexico. So before we unpack some of this and remind listeners kind of about the subpart F and branch rules and the facts of the case, why is this generally important for, for taxpayers to understand this particular case? Because it is far more sweeping than, than just a, a maquiladora type structure. It is, um, because it talks about a number of areas around subpart F income that are implicated by the branch rule, and particularly the way that both courts interpreted the branch rule was by going back to policy. And whenever you go back to policy, you sort of take yourself out of the detailed regulations and what might have been the uh, Romanet three type of explanations, and you're back into trying to interpret what someone meant by the general statute. And that then could apply to not just maquila based manufacturing structures, but it could apply to other types of structures that are in place, which might be disregarded entity structures that involve disregarded royalties payments, disregarded interest payments. But I think the way that the courts have backed up into the legislative history and tried to seek what intent was, that intent can be a dangerous thing. And I think that's a lot of what the taxpayer and a lot of us practitioners have um, as concern about this particular case is that we thought for years and years we had a set of regulations which were fairly clear, had been interpreted consistently, and uh, yet I think we woke up on that day in December surprised once again, mm -hmm. uh, questioning whether what we had been doing for the last 30 years was, was really, um, if we all understood it the same way. Right, and there seems to be pretty strong general consensus, and we'll talk a little bit about the en banc petition that, that Whirlpool has, has filed, but there seems to be pretty strong consensus, at least amongst advisors and taxpayers, about how these rules operate and whether we should actually apply the regulations. And I agree, I think that the court really just stepped, did not even do an analysis underneath the regulations and had what appears to be a very results-oriented approach. And I think, Tom, that was actually something we mentioned on the tax court case. and. I wasn't sure it was possible, but it appears as though the Sixth Circuit has taken an even more results-oriented approach than the original tax court case. Yeah, I think that's true. And you know, some of that you can see by going and digging back through the facts in the case. Maybe before we dive into the particular facts, because I do want to unpack that. I mean, you have spent most of your 30-plus year career doing a lot of just business model, you know, understanding the tax implications of business models. And this example with the maquiladora is really just one example of a procurement or a supply chain structure. But maybe uh, talk a little bit uh, about that, and because I, I think that there's broad applicability and you know this potential of just not even ignoring the regulations. But talk a little bit about from more of an operational and business perspective, really what this means. Yeah, I think. Thank you for that, because I think it's a really important element of what we do as tax practitioners is. Our job is to make sure the business understands 
what's happening within their footprint that they've chosen and to help them make some of those choices as well by understanding what the cost might be or what a risk might be of doing business a certain way. So job one, I think for us is compliance, obviously, and you can't do compliance unless you understand what the transactions are in a country, um, how it is that your company is touching an individual country, how it sources, how it sells, how it manages its intellectual property. And in this case, we're talking about a, about a sourcing decision, which is very common. What the use of Makila's um, is not a income tax motivated determination. Generally, this is something that a company chose because especially where you have a US based market, Mexico provides a close source of supply. So mm -hmm. a short supply chain, we've learned how important that is right. recently. Uh, it also provides a low cost country environment in terms of wages and benefits and other things that might influence the cost of manufacture of a product. Um, and then in addition to that, Mexico provides uh, almost frictionless system for manufacturing and moving product and raw materials across the U.S. border and through this Maquila system. And it makes that available because it's trying to encourage companies to come in and uh, hire their people, hire people, yeah. right, and create economic activity in the country. A lot of companies use this type of structure, the Maquila structure. What's interesting about a Maquila structure, though, is in addition to these sort of trade and customs and indirect tax opportunities and benefits, is it it does have uh, some tax income tax nuances associated with it as well. If you're a principal company with respect to that Maquila and you being a foreign principal, and that can be a U.S.-based principal, or in the case of Whirlpool, a Luxembourg-based mm -hmm. principal, the Maquila statute requires that you, as that foreign principal, own assets within the country. And a lot of times that creates a branch or a taxable presence or a permanent establishment. But under the Maquila rules, it's specifically exempted. It says you can not only own these assets, but as the foreign principal, you can engage in manufacturing activity and management of manufacturing activity also without creating a permanent establishment. The other sort of interesting element from an income tax standpoint about Maquilas would be the fact that the way that they're compensated for tax purposes. Uh, there is a safe harbor available uh, for companies that is based on cost, where based on a cost plus, if you compensate the maquila at that level, it's viewed to be, in a quote, arm's length for Mexican tax purposes. That number is typically, that safe harbor, much lower than you would benchmark for an otherwise routine manufacturing function. And so there's an arbitrage that exists between um, two very important principles for cross-border taxation here. There's an arbitrage with respect to what creates a permanent establishment. So we know that generally owning assets and conducting manufacturing activity mm -hmm. would create a permanent establishment, but not in a maquila sense. Same thing with respect to the transfer pricing, that what we think is arm length, arm's length pricing, Mexico has made formulary mm -hmm. in that extent, so there's a difference that exists there too. So let's just dive right into the facts because I think we've kind of laid out at least the, the beginning pieces with respect to how the Maquila structure works in, in Mexico. Um, the, the, the key, I think, piece of the analysis that presumably gave both the tax court and the appellate court unease is that the way the Luxembourg law works. So you would describe the Mexican law that says, listen, they're just going to tax the Maquila door at a relatively low rate. All of the other activities, because the way the Maquila works, the raw materials, the inventory, as well as the manufacturing assets are all owned by the principal. And so in, in the Whirlpool case, they were all owned by, by Luxembourg. And Mexico says, yeah, there's a P in Mexico, but we're not going to tax it. That's Mexico's rule. And then Luxembourg generally has a rule that says, well, if you have income attributable to a permanent establishment outside of Luxembourg, that's not subject to tax in Luxembourg. Right. So we ended up with a pot of income, to your point, that was not subject to, to, to tax. But maybe can you fill in some of the other details with respect to and I, there wasn't who was in Luxembourg and maybe some some other important facts that that both of the courts I think relied on in coming to their their decision. Yeah, Luxembourg at best could be described as thinly substance. Right. There was no permanent presence in Luxembourg. Um, also, I guess with respect to the permanent establishment of Luxembourg that would exist in Mexico, it was. 
primarily based on the assets that were on location mm -hmm. at the Makila facility. And then when you go to look at where most of the manufacturing activity was taking place and the physical activity as well, it was outside of the Luxembourg entity itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think another important fact, Tom, is that there were no marketing, distribution, kind of salespeople, right, sitting within Luxembourg or or in, in Mexico. It was more the manufacturing activities and then presumably marketing people and then all of the, what I commonly refer to as the demand chain profit yeah. was, was presumably sitting in the U.S. or Mexico or wherever the ultimate place of, of location there was. There was no the need sales. for marketing. It right. was an intercompany supply arrangement. Right. It was, and nothing wrong with that. I mean, just you don't necessarily market to yourself. You have a source of supply, and there's probably a supply contract in place that has been negotiated and concluded, but there's no need for an active sales solicitation or marketing element to that particular transaction. But it, that point does sort of reflect upon where I thought the tax court decision was going to ultimately go and where I thought we might see reflected within the Court of Appeals. But... What we have, as practitioners have debated over the years is, what do you mean by sales branch? Right. Does it require sales activity? And that's been the common perception of those rules and people have planned around that word activity that when you're looking to find a branch and when you, when you have to do the branch test that you're looking to identify an activity. And in this case, you know, much to your description, there was no sales activity taking place. It was just an unnatural act within this particular relationship. Mm -hmm. So so let's start there then. And I think we've provided just kind of a brief overview of, of what is foreign-based company sales and then the branch rule. And I appreciate we could probably spend the next 40 minutes just kind of as an overview of those rules. But can you distill that down in a couple of minutes before we go to the tax court's decision? Yeah, a, a couple of, um, simply, if you think about foreign-based company sales, it's a sale involving a related party where you've sourced the goods from a related party or you've sold the goods to a related party and you haven't necessarily engaged in the manufacturing activity yourself. So it, you know, the, the fundamental element is the presence of a related party at the front end or the tail end of that transaction. So in the case of Whirlpool here, the related party was the fact that the Luxembourg company sold to the U.S. Mm -hmm. the U.S. company for further distribution in the U.S. market, and then how does the branch rule, at least from our historic interpretation and under understanding, generally work? So, yeah, the branch rule is was a uh, um, modification of those general rules where it said back from 1962. 1962. I will remind listeners, so a long time. That's long standing, right? That it's been around and interpreted mm -hmm. over that period of time. But the branch was trying to get to a circumstance where you would utilize a, um, a branch and a branch in such a way that it would create the deferral in the transaction. So if you had a German manufacturing company that might sell through a um, offshore location in a low tax jurisdiction, Singapore or something like that, where the income might be lightly taxed, as a CFC, you could still be treated as the manufacturer of the product and eligible for an exemption. And there's there's no foreign-based company sales income in that structure. Because, because there's, there's no related party transaction. No related party transaction. Whereas with the branch rule, what it required you to do was essentially create or uh, create a virtual mm -hmm. intercompany transaction where the head office would be selling to the branch, which was treated as a CFC under the, the branch rules. If there was a tax rate disparity between those um, two jurisdictions, then the branch rules applied. And that really is does kind of set up some of the plot as mm -hmm. well for you know where the Court of Appeals started to depart from maybe commonly held understanding of how the branch rule works, that it's a, Kind of a two-step process that you know first i determine does a branch exist mm -hmm. uh, if a branch exists then i treat that branch as a cfc i impute this related party sale transaction through it and then i t make a tax rate disparity test from that and if the tax rate disparity is large enough then i have 
foreign-based company sales income, but only to the extent that I don't otherwise qualify for an exception to that. And I think that's, in many cases, that's where practitioners that reviewed the Court of Appeals case were woke up and were very surprised that morning in December. Yeah, the way I always think about it, Tom, is that you know 954D2, which is the branch rule, is really a backstop to the general rule under 954D1. So to your point with Germany and Singapore, they didn't want, you know, Congress didn't want the, the tax policy, you know, from, from the the original subpart F rules didn't want you to set up something as a branch that you could otherwise set up as a CFC right. to effectively move related party income with the, the sale of product. And But but what the, the rules and the regulations specifically tell you to do as a backstop is that once you meet this tax rate disparity test and you have to trade create a separate CFC, that you then effectively do the D1 test as a result of D2. And we're going to get back to that because that is really one of the fundamental issues that I have with the case and I think that could really transform the application of sub F. But maybe before we get to the Sixth Circuit case, and we've already hinted at it, can you remind our listeners, and again, I would encourage people to go back and listen to our original podcast of just what the tax court reasoning was. Sure. Um, I'll try to put that in a nutshell, too. But the tax court reasoning was based upon an evaluation of, again, a judge who thought that D1 did apply in the sense that you need to go out and evaluate the entity and the enterprise, but once he saw a branch in existence, you know, felt comfortable going out and applying the branch rule in that situation, all the proper analysis steps. But then rather than reach into the regulations to try to evaluate and understand the manufacturing branch rule, what the judge did was go back and take a look at what he presumed to be the legislative history for that. And rather than make a hyper-technical argument around the regulations, I think he found it simpler to go back to the original intent of the drafters in his mind, which was the reason the branch rule is in place is if I see a separation of income from the manufacturing activity, then there, that is the separation which the rules are intended to prevent, or they want to eliminate deferral in that particular case. And in this case, with respect to Whirlpool, then he was able to find that there is this separation that that sales income had been moved away from the place of manufacturing, and concluded that in, in effect there was foreign-based sales company income uh, for Whirlpool. Yeah, and and a couple of the things that weren't addressed, as as we had mentioned, was this whole concept of well, you have a CFC, and then we have a manufacturing branch there still is a question of whether there are purchasing and sales activities to go back to this, you know, the, our, our earlier part of our discussion. That was not addressed in the tax court case. And I think it was something that many of us who've stared at those regulations were hoping for. That's where we thought it was going to go. You somewhere. and I have debated a lot about that particular yeah. issue. And, you know, reasonable minds can differ certainly on kind of how you interpret that sale and purchasing activities. The other thing that I think was absent in the tax court case was a description of well, if you do have a manufacturing branch and then we do have to create this hypothetical, you know, fictional CFC that you described, well, how do you allocate income between the manufacturing branch and what's referred to as the remainder, what's in the, the CFC? And to your point, there was very thin substance in, in Luxembourg. And so, you know, utilizing transfer pricing principles, there would seem to be not very much income attributable back to Luxembourg and all of that income, or at least a huge portion of it, would have been attributable to the permanent establishment in Mexico related to those manufacturing activities. That's right. But I think what's important on that element is that is the underlying facts that were presented in the case to the judge, is that he was taking a look at, from a Mexican income tax return standpoint, there was no income being reported in Mexico. Right. So therefore, how could income be attributable to Mexico if you haven't reported anything there? The way transfer pricing reports were presented, uh, the way the tax reporting was done, um, as well as, as we talked about in the very first part of this discussion was that that's the underlying law as well, that you can have a presence within Mexico without creating a permanent establishment under the Mequila statute, not then not having income attributed to it for income tax purposes, but from an economic standpoint, it's still hard to uh, 
um, say that the income wasn't attributable to Mexico. Mm -hmm. If you take the logic to say, I don't have activity anywhere else, including Luxembourg, mm -hmm. but I do have significant assets sitting in Mexico, which could comprise how some of that income should be um, allocated towards the activities that the CFC has in Mexico. In which case then, the company would have ended up with income in Mexico, which is the place of manufacturing right. as well. So it, you know, I, I can't help but look at these cases um, through the facts that they are presented in. One, one other important thing to note, just with respect to the application of the subpart F rules, there is a specific exception in our foreign-based company sales rules that if the, the product is either manufactured by the CFC or manufactured in the CFC's country of incorporation, that that's generally not subpart F income. And that'll be more relevant as we get to the dissent. But it's important for, for listeners to, to remember that to the, to the extent that that income was attributable to a Mexican CFC for U.S. tax purposes, well, because the product was manufactured in Mexico, then presumably, presumably that wouldn't have been subpart F income. So let's move to the, the Sixth Circuit. And uh, what was the rationale um, by, by the, the judge in, in the Sixth Circuit? Um, in 10 words or less, that he found that there was a substantial tax deferral effect a term which has never been used before, as far as I know. Every one of those words individually means something, but all put together in a phrase and uses a test uh, in the branch rules, I don't think we've ever seen that before. Yeah, that is not the test in the regulations that we just went through. It is not, it is not. And it, you know, again, I, I can't help but think that you have to consider the record which the Sixth Circuit was working on in this case, what the facts were. Um, it wasn't clearly laid out in the opinion, but I have to, if you read that opinion and in the back of your mind, you put all of these facts, you could sort of make his analysis work. Yes, there was substantial tax deferral in this case, but, but we, we don't really know what that means. We don't it? know what it means. We, what we know is that neither court went beyond, the court didn't go beyond that to try to evaluate, um, well, substantial does that mean, or deferral, what does that mean with respect to Mexican law, right. with or respect to U.S. law, Lux with respect to Luxembourg law? My presumption was, was maybe it was deferral. Luxembourg law, but again, it wasn't, it wasn't in there. Yeah, and even if it's U.S. law, if you say that, well, the reason these foreign-based company sales income rules exist is because they allow for deferral from current taxation outside of the guilty rules, but that the deferral would be well, the income was eligible under subpart F to be, to be excluded from subpart F. And in that case, I think we've, the rules are clear going back to 954 D2 and D1 is that there are certain exceptions apply. Even if you have income which would otherwise be considered foreign-based company sales income, there are a list of exceptions like the manufacturing exception, like the same country mm -hmm. exception. Uh, which need to be applied. And in this case, uh, you know, again, the rationale of the Court of Appeals was that substantial tax deferral exists. We don't need to go any further in evaluating it, which is, you know, again, I think if you try to take that as a general rule and apply it to every set of facts, um, probably can't get there. If you take it with just the Whirlpool facts, maybe. Right. Yeah, and, and I think what was interesting is that, you know, the, that, the, the judge specifically held that the foreign-based company sales income can arise under the statute without the branch rule regulation. So going through to your point, do we have manufacturing activities? Do we meet the definition of a manufacturing branch? Okay, draw CFC around it. Do we, um, once we draw CFC around it, do we have rate disparity? Do we have, do we meet one of, one of the exceptions? And so what I found very interesting is that the way this judge held was that this D2 rule operates completely independently of the D1 rule, such as the D2 effectively creates an operative rule that you no longer apply any of the tests that you would otherwise f uh, find in yeah, D1. Right. Once you have a branch, your debt it's income all, is subject in to tax. Right. And, and, and there was no, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, there was no discussion about how do you, because it's still, measurement. how do you measure the income that's allocated between the remainder and the branch? But maybe before we unpack that a little bit, what did the dissent say? 
because the dissent was was very interesting as well. It seemed to got more of a consistent answer with I think what many of us would have thought in the tax community, but there was still and then there was also this substantial transformation argument. But yeah, I think they took a much different view of that. I mean, they, they went back and they actually were sort of diligent to and faithful to the regulations, where they said, you no, you need to go through this in a more deliberate process and that that deliberate process is appropriate in this case. And if you did that, you'd go back and say that when you drew the box around the branch as a CFC, that you had manufacturing activity, or at least it needed to be tested. There's perhaps a fact that needs to go back to the tax court to be determined, but you know, whether in fact the manufacturing activity was taking place in Mexico. So that they, I think the, the dissent, when, Practitioners took a look at the majority opinion. There was confusion by everyone. When we take a look at the dissent, I think we're comforted by the fact that that's traditionally the way that we view that these rules have worked. Mm -hmm. And we're not quite sure yet, you know, what has incented these alternative views towards um, towards these fact patterns. Yeah, and, and then the, the dissent specifically then applied and said, okay, well, the branch rule needs to be in conjunction with D1. And then they say, well, when you draw that box, if you will, when you create that Mexican branch as a separate CFC, well, it's doing the manufacturing activities. It has substantially transformed those that, that product. And so that income would have been exempted from subpart F. And the dissent said, nope, you know, this would have gone for the taxpayer because we draw a separate CFC, a, a fictional CFC around the branch, their manufacturing sub, substantially transforming wouldn't otherwise yeah. be sub F. What went in was completely different than what came out and all that activity took place in Mexico. So what I wanted to just remind listeners of what actually the statute says in D2, and I, I think we were on my 91st podcast and I've tried not to read any specific pieces of legislation, but I did wanna just get your reaction to, to what it actually says in D2. So it says, for purpose of determining foreign-based company sales income, when a CFC carries on branch activities outside its country of incorporation, so we have Mexico branch outside of Luxembourg, and the use of the branch has substantially the same effect as if such branch or similar establishment were a wholly owned subsidiary corporation deriving such income. So in my view, that kind of creates this, hey, you've got the separate CFC. Yeah. And here's important. Then under regulations prescribed by the secretary, the income attributable to the carry on of such branch activities, one shall be treated as income derived by a wholly owned subsidiary of the CFC and shall constitute foreign based company sales income. And so what are we to think as practitioners and taxpayers? That Crystal clear in the statute, isn't it? It feels that very... That we should be having this discussion around the regulations themselves. And that's where we always thought it would be in the sense of let's discuss what activities are. Let's discuss how much income is allocable. In fact, let's even heck, let's discuss what a branch is. And that's the, the level of argument that I thought we'd have here. Uh, but we didn't. Essentially, we've got in the tax court an approach which says, nope, we need to go back to policy. Don't worry about the regulations. Those are too detailed, I guess. Mm -hmm. But let's go back and take this fundamental concept of have you separated income from the place of manufacturing and, it, and sort of the, the sense of abuse. And then in, in the Sixth Circuit, same kind of thing where it's we still haven't gone into the regulations aside from the dissenting opinion. But we, what we've done instead is kind of created a brand new test, which says, has there been any substantial deferral in this case? And it's, so that's what is really surprising about this. And it, it makes it hard to operate as a practitioner in this area, unless you can make yourself comfortable, like I'm doing here, of just saying that it's the facts, Tom, it's the facts, it's the facts of this particular case and the way that they were interpreted and I think it has all the way, it goes all the way back to the, just, um, Aquila is a unique environment to operate in. It has these elements of tax arbitrage that exist, uh, but in no way are untoward in the sense that this was all intended by the government of Mexico, it was intended by the government of Luxembourg. Um, I think the outcome was even intended by our own reg drafters, because if you take these facts and take it through you know, the positions that Whirlpool had presented as, a, as the defendant in this case, um, or defendant in the tax court case, would be to say that, um, yeah, I think that 
the facts that I've presented are ones which also the regulations allow, the U.S. Subpart F regulations under 954-3. So if we can kind of rationalize the, the Sixth Circuit's opinion based on, on, on these limited facts, you know, how could this logic apply to other structures outside of Makila structure? And I think that's something that a number of us are really struggling with, and particularly for Sixth Circuit taxpayers. But then as we think about taxpayers across the country, if there really is a new standard that any branch that's set up and that all that income can be considered foreign-based company sales without applying any of these tests, then if you don't have the exact fact pattern from a Makila perspective, do we need to go back and rethink the analysis for every Sixth Circuit taxpayer, for every other taxpayer, until we have some other guidance. Yep, it would say, um, that type of a reaction would say, throw away the regs. I mean, any if any of your defense was built upon interpretation of the, regu of the regulatory environment, you need to step back away from that. Because if you really do believe that this is new law, in a sense, that then you have to apply the tax court standard of, have I separated income from my manufacturing activity? Or you have to apply the Court of Appeals approach, which is, do I have a substantial deferral? All different tests, all novel tests, um, all ones which I would say uh, we don't have any guidance for. And so that's why I think it's important to not to get too carried away with these two particular rulings. I mean, as you mentioned at the outset, um, there is a petition for an en banc hearing here that may happen. As a result of that, the court may overturn the ruling is a possibility. Um, but what, what also I think that taxpayers can do is recognize that and try to distinguish themselves based on the facts. And I think that's where um, a lot of the opportunity exists, um, how you've documented your transfer pricing and how you've indicated how income is earned and where it is earned. Make it as supportive as possible. And you have the pen on, those, on your 6662 reporting, country by country reporting, anything that you can create in that regard to support your position. Uh, your 5471 reporting, if you're a US-based MNC, that it's making sure the file that you've put together is um, as supportive of your case as possible, that you've gone out there and created something in an advocacy sense that lays out the facts the way that you want them to. And I can imagine that you know going back, if, if we could sort of restate some of those facts in the Whirlpool case, a different outcome would probably ensue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you had mentioned, and just to give a little bit more clarity for listeners, it was on January 20th of 2022 that Whirlpool petitioned the Sixth Circuit for a rehearing on Bonk. And so what that means is if a rehearing, if granted, it would vacate the previous opinion and judgment of the Sixth Circuit, and all eligible and participating active Sixth Circuit judges would review the case. Um, Whirlpool would then have 90 days from the date of a rehearing request is denied. If it is denied, um, or the subsequent entry of a judgment if a rehearing is granted to then petition for certiorari with the U.S. Supreme Court. As much as I would absolutely love to see a Supreme Court case on the foreign-based company sales <laughs> branch rules. Like they're I, busier with other things. One, one might assume that they're busier with other things, and particularly with only one circuit weighing in. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see if this is granted en banc. And I know there have been a number of different practitioners and taxpayer organizations that have come out and said, hey, the statute specifically says under regulations prescribed by the secretary, you know, they have direct authority to be able to issue those regulations that a court of law should apply the regulations to, to the taxpayer's facts. Yeah, you, you would hope so. And I think that's a good point, too, is you've had a number of amicus briefs filed as well in this case uh, from other interested parties, because I, this does have a significant scope to it that if you just look at the Makilas, there's hundreds of Makilas set up by US-based MNCs <clears throat> inside their structure that they've done for business purposes. And then to the extent that this might apply to sort of any deferral situation right. in terms of the uh, Court of Appeals Sixth Circuit, yeah, that could be a, a lot of taxpayers could be affected by this. Right, because anybody who's really effectively manufacturing through either a branch or disregarded entity, this would change the standard. And, you know, if it didn't just apply to these particular facts, and that right. are that, that, that fact pattern is thousands of taxpayers. It does. And, yeah, and as you said earlier, I think the, think about a maquila as a sourcing structure or a procurement structure that this could apply to, 
not just the way you source out of Mexico, but source out of Asia right. or Europe or the Americas okay. in any other sense, uh, any other countries that, yeah, I'm sure that we've set up legal entity structures that have disregarded any of these in them as well. Right, and that's just been obviously very popular, particularly over the course of the last last 20 years. And I will note that these branch rules came out well before the invent of check the box, right? Oh, yeah. And so, so Congress was was very focused on this, which is why we've been studying these rules to understand to understand the implications. So maybe in closing, Tom, um, you know, you, you've always been uh, 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 somebody who, who is cool and collected and has been able to. To, to rationalize some of these things. And, and for me, I'm, I just still get this sense of panic when I, when I read these rules. And I think you had already you know, mentioned some of the points, but maybe kind of remind, remind us, like, why should we not panic at this point? Or should we? No, no, I don't think so. Because, but I would suggest some steps, which yeah. I think are important. One was um, be afraid of the known. Like, um, rather than just sort of dismissing whether this exists in your structure, I think I, w I would be very deliberate about going and looking to make sure I understood where this position might come up, to take advice from others in terms of um, how broadly could these rules be applied within my particular fact pattern. Um, and then a second thing I think is that um, control what you're afraid of too, in the sense of what can you do uh, from the position of advocacy to build up your position in this regard. To what can you do from a documentation standpoint? Uh, we had a December uh, judgment in this case, mm -hmm. so uh, I know a lot of taxpayers are out making sure that their provi tax provisions are right. appropriately documented. Um, again, I, that's something that I would recognize the importance of a decision like this, make sure there was an effort to either put something in writing if you haven't done it before, or review what you put in writing previously to make sure it does address um, these cases from the standpoint of perhaps being able to distinguish your fact pattern on the facts. And maybe the only other thing I would add to that is that the IRS and Treasury have been very quiet, at least from what I've seen, uh, with respect to, to this particular decision. And you know, when it seems to potentially really gut some of their regulatory authority that could have much broader implications beyond just the foreign-based company sales branch rules. And so I'm, I'm very interested to see how Treasury and or the IRS would, would approach this because, again, they have spent 50 years developing these rules that effectively, you know, were not analyzed in, in detail really in either of these cases. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, right, because it, it would embolden the IRS on an examination front but it would also cause them some pause, I think, with respect to, you thought you had regulatory authority, did you really? Right. Or and how's it gonna be treated by the courts once they go back and rewrite legislative history or reinterpret legislative history? Absolutely, well, well, Tom, if this ends up in the Supreme Court, we'll have you back for Whirlpool 3.0. <laughs> Um, I'm also interested to see if there may be some other appeals court that would take this on. That could be years from now. Um, but it'll be very interesting to, to see how this develops because this is just went an entirely different direction than I think many of us anticipated after the original tax court ruling. We were really hoping for a detailed analysis of those regulations because I was hoping to come on here and to debate with you some of the points that we've been debating for the past 20 years. But unfortunately, we didn't get any of that. No, we did not. All right. Well, Tom, thank you very much for joining. Thank you, edition. Doug. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Tom Quinn, PwC International Tax Partner, for joining me on this podcast. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.